Locked On Blue Devils, your daily podcast on the Duke Blue Devils, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome into another edition of the Locked On Blue Devils podcast. So excited to have you here with us on this Tuesday, May 17th, 2022. My name is JJ Jackson. I proudly serve as the host of this podcast. Follow us on Twitter at LO underscore Blue Devils. Follow me on Twitter at underscore JJ underscore Jackson underscore. Be sure to follow and subscribe to this podcast right now for free on your favorite podcast platform. Watch our show daily on YouTube. Like and subscribe. Share the videos with your friends. Leave comments. Let us know what you thought, what you would like us to talk about as we get ready for the summer offseason months. On today's edition, of Locked On Blue Devils. I've got my good buddy Josh Cox from Duke Football Talks Section 17 podcast. We're going to talk a little bit about Duke football today. Let's be positive. Let's talk about some strengths going into year one for Mike Elko taking over this program. I think too often when you think about a new coach coming in, you think about issues that might be in your program and that sort of thing. But let's talk positive about this Duke football show as Josh Cox joins us here on today's edition of the program as we get set to get going here on this Tuesday. So, Josh, hope that you're doing well, man. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah, JJ, thanks for having me again, man. It was great to be back. I missed last week, uh, but great to be back this week, man, and excited to talk some Duke football for sure. Man, let's dive right into it then. We're talking about kind of the, the change in the guard. Uh, we had some recruiting a couple of weeks ago on the show, and Grayson Loftus and Paul Davis, a couple of the new uh, first commits of the Mike Elko era, uh, John Garcia Jr., our recruiting insider, kind of talking about the blueprint for Duke football. But I think it is important to highlight. It's not. It, it, yes, there are some things that clearly need to improve, but it's not uh, as bare of a cupboard as some might think. Yeah, for sure. And by the way, a great episode uh, with Grayson and, and Paul Davis. I enjoyed hearing from both of those guys. Um, you know, right now they're, they're, they are our two uh, signees and looking forward to seeing that class built out. But those are two stand-up guys. It was great hearing from them. Great job on those interviews and enjoyed that. But, yeah, um, you know, I, I, I agree. It was interesting to hear the perspective um, of others as they look into the Duke football program. And um, and maybe it's not as, as bare, as you said, as, as we can think sometimes. And, you know, I know we're not here today to talk about this, but we've seen some transfer portal action um, take place over the last couple of weeks as well. Um, and those are all good things. And so, like you said, man, I like looking at things, you know, glass half full. Um, and I'm looking forward today to talking about some of the positives of Duke football for sure. Yeah, go to Friday's show. I kind of give a rundown of, of those transfer portal guys, and we'll do that in the future. Five new players uh, coming over from other schools right now to play for Duke this upcoming season, which could be huge. You're getting experience right away. And, and, and really, we could start there as a positive for this Duke football team. A strength already is that they have been able to kind of get some guys to plug in right away out of the gates here as Elko starts to get going. Yes, on the show, we had the high school recruits here, but to get proven players already at the FBS college level, that was big. Yeah, it is. I mean, football of all sports, the difference between an 18, 19 year old kid and a 22 year old man is, is very, there's a lot of difference that those four, three to four years that we're going to be seeing the age difference with these, especially grad transfers uh, that are coming in. I just feel like it's going to be important. It's the difference between, you know, if you want to compare it to basketball, it's the difference between a maybe awkward 6'10 freshman coming in who's not quite caught up to his body yet. And then Theo John, right? It's a difference in that, like a grown man and a developing kid. And so if nothing else, these grad transfers, I believe are just going to bring us some physicality and a little bit of manhood there. Now, I believe uh, a couple of them especially are going to, you know, start and be major contributors for us. But even if they weren't, even if they provided depth, it's going to be depth of a 22-year-old as opposed to 18-year-old. And so I think that's great, especially in football. A big thing for the Duke football team is as we get set, obviously we've exited the spring portion of the calendar. The Duke football talk section 17 podcast is available wherever you get your podcast. Josh and his buddies do a great job of kind of recapping the spring game, what they saw from going to practices, 
throughout and that sort of thing. So so let's kind of talk there. When you look at the offensive side of the football for the Blue Devils, what is a strength? I think there are a lot of question marks, and it starts there at the quarterback spot. But uh, maybe versatility in that quarterback spot could even be a bit of a strength for the Duke football. Like when, when I said, Josh, what are you thinking about uh, positively about the Duke offense? What came to mind? Yeah, honestly, the first thing that came to mind to me was the offensive line. Uh, it's the first thing that came to mind. I believe last year uh, we developed uh, a legitimate two deep. And by the time the season ended last year, we were basically on a 50-50 every other uh, series rotation. Um, and so we went basically 10 deep, you know, on that line. And, um, and, I, and, and if I'm not mistaken here, I believe only two of those 10 uh, graduated um, in Cade Parmalee and Jack Wallaba. So I believe we're bringing back eight out of the 10. Obviously, some guys will fill in those spots. But I like that. I like the fact that our line is going to be stable. Uh, obviously, you've got uh, guys like Jacob Monk that are that are now multi-year starters on that line. Um, so I look at the offensive line. I think Addison Penn uh, or Brian Foley will step right into that center position. I see our offensive line as a stabilizing piece on this year's team, and I think that's very important. We've spoken in the past, when you think of football, you have to win the line of scrimmage. If you can't win the line of scrimmage, you can't. If you can't run block, you're not going to run the football well. If you can't pass protect, your quarterback's not going to be successful. And so you got to win at the line of scrimmage on offense, especially. So I, I like our offensive line, and then I think the natural progression off of that offensive line is I love our tight end room. Um, I, I I love the the two headed monster that we have right now in Cole Finney and Nikki Dalmalin. I think those two guys, once again, multi year players that have proven that they can play, and then. Um, bringing in uh, the true freshman Anders uh, just uh, got on campus. I saw uh, online uh, supposed to be a really, really solid contributor. I don't know if he'll be a first year contributor, but um, yeah, I think those are the two areas to me uh, that I look at the offense and I'm like those that's the positives. Now, obviously we could talk wide receiver, running back quarterback, and we can do that if you want to, there are some positives there, but I believe the biggest positive is, is sitting there on that line. Yeah, no, I think I think you're exactly right. The fact that that position group is so solidified, it does have the experience, does have guys that are pushing one another. Too deep is so important at any position. But, re, I mean, the trenches, like injuries are going to happen throughout the season. Unfortunately, oftentimes, they're in the trenches. And so to have uh, kind of the flexibility, the versatility, whatever you want to call it, uh, I think is so important in that unit. You're right. When you look at the quarterbacks, the wide running backs, the wide receivers, uh, while there might be some question marks out there, there are also your handful of proven guys that are coming back. And I think the experience in those rooms, whether it be Jalen Calhoun and Eli Pankle or, or Jordan Waters at the running back spot, that's kind of where I look at a, a strength of the Duke offense that Kevin Johns has to be excited about in his first year as offensive coordinator is that he does have some experienced playmakers. He absolutely does, and, and I think you're going to see a guy like Jalen Calhoun, um, you know, be be a leader on this team. Period, uh, not just in the, in the wide receiver room. Um, and then the running back room, we, we've we've laughed about it. And, and by the way, Trent Davis transferring out of that wide uh, that running back room, um, but there's still four or five guys in that room uh, led by Jordan Waters. And so um, you're right; the experience there is important. Um, you know, can't forget Daryl Harding uh, Jr. as well uh, in, in the wide receiver room. The question, Martin, really is who's going to get these guys the football? Uh, is it is it going to be Riley Leonard or is it going to be Jordan Moore? And that's the question that every Duke fan is wondering. Is there going to be a combination of both? And I, I believe that that in the the scheme of Duke football, right, where we're currently at, I believe we can be successful with a quarterback rotation. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of that per se, but I believe that we could. And the reason why is because these guys are so different in their makeup and they bring, you know, the different uh, things to the table that the other one doesn't bring necessarily. And uh, I think it could work. You know, my only issue if we ever rotate quarterbacks is, you know, when one of them makes a mistake, it's like, man, if we just had the other guy in, he probably wouldn't have made that mistake. You know, and it's like, you're always kind of second guessing yourself uh, when you rotate quarterbacks. But who knows? I'm not the quarterback room is not a negative in any way in Duke football. There's just not something to look at and say, man, that's a really big positive right there, other than the fact that we have multiple options. 
And the best part of all of this with that quarterback room in particular is that, you know, you just look at the calendar. It's May 17th. We're nowhere near the first game of the season or fall camp even starting back up. So all it's going to be at this point is speculation. But the fact that you do have a couple of guys that you feel comfortable about, at least there are guys that you could see being the starting quarterback. I think that's a good spot to be in for Duke. Let's talk defense. I want to do that in just a moment. Again, Josh Cox from Duke Football Talks. Section 17 podcast is joining us here on today's show. Our show today brought to you by Built Bar. Imagine dipping your finger into a plastic tub of birthday cake frosting and then opening your eyes and realizing that it was only 150 calories and 16 grams of protein. That's what it's like to eat a birthday cake puff from Built Bar. I just received my birthday cake puffs and I've never had anything like this before. They're available right now and we can't promise that they will be tomorrow. So go get them right now at Built.com. If you haven't tried the puffs, I'll let you in on a little secret because that's what friends do. The chocolate-covered marshmallow protein bar. Yes, delicious flavored marshmallow covered in 100% real chocolate brought to you by our friends over at Built Bar. This time, it's birthday cake flavor, 150 calories, 16 grams of protein, and only 9 grams of sugar. Go to Built.com, use promo code LOCKED15, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, for 15% off your order. Built.com, promo code LOCKED15, for 15% off at Built.com. Welcome back in here to Locked On Blue Devils on this Tuesday, May 17th. J.J. Jackson hanging out with my buddy Josh Cox. Let's talk a little defense. Uh, I'll start with a, a strength. I'll get you to comment on it to kind of open up our discussion and then I'll set you up for more of a position group maybe. But uh, a strength has got to be that your head coach has been one of the top defensive coordinators in the sport over the last decade. So you've got a good visionary kind of taking over that side of the football. Yeah, and we've seen it in spring practices. Um, yeah, and we, we joke with Coach Elko. Uh, he's like, you know, I spend an equal amount of time, you know, with the – with the offense and the defense. And we're like, that sounds really good, coach. Like, that, I know that's what you want to do, but he naturally, it's like he can't help himself. He naturally gravitates over uh, to the defense. And I love that. I mean, I, I, I believe, uh, you know, obviously we want our head coach to, to function in his, in his best. Right. And he's at his best when he's, when he's talking defense. And so, um, yeah, it's really awesome to have a guy with the track record uh, that Mike Elko has, um, just to think of what he did, not only at the Notre Dames and the Texas A&M's, but what he did before that as he was moving up the ranks in college football. And so I, I feel like not only has he been where we are, but he has also been where we want to get to. And so that is exactly what we want in a head coach. And so, yeah, that, that is the number one uh, positive <laughs> leading into this season for sure. All right, so then let's talk personnel because there are definitely some leaders on this Duke football team on the defensive side of the ball uh, that really speak for the whole team. They carry that much uh, weight. Their power, their voice means a lot to their teammates and that sort of thing. But you look at personnel on the defense, is there a strength that jumps out to you? Yeah, I mean, individually, uh, player-wise, I'm, I know we'll get to this, but, I mean, Dwayne Carter on that D-line. But I believe the position group – that is the strongest returning defense is our linebacking core. Um, uh, just, just Shaka Hayward um, is a fantastic player. Led us in tackles last year. Um, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. As a, a podcast, we've gotten to know several of the players fairly well. We've not had many interactions with Shaka, and it may be his personality. Um, he may be a quite a little bit of a quieter guy. I don't know that. I just tell you this: his play on the field. I don't care if he says two words to us. If he's playing football like he's playing, um, then then that's great. So you got Shaka. Then, obviously, there was a little bit of a rotation there. Um, at, who started with him in that four two five? Um, you know, there Syed Stevens has, has had some time there. Dorian Mosey, we know that we love Dorian. Um, then we have the return of Rocky Shelton, who two years ago was his uh, starting linebacker with him, and so. You know, those guys that we've seen, Ryan Smith, um, Trey Freeman, I mean, we could just go down the list. And so I feel like the linebacker room is deep. Um, I would say they're deep enough that we had a transfer 
um, who plays some linebacker slash defensive end. And I would say if if my man wants any play in time as a grad transfer, it's going to probably need to be on that D-line um, as opposed to in the linebacker room because we are so deep at linebacker. And uh, I do believe we will see a little bit more of a 4-3 look in some some situations than what we've seen in the past, which is great because we had the we had the numbers, we had the guys that can do it. Yeah, that's the thing when you when you kind of make that transition, bring another linebacker on the field. Obviously, you need more bodies and uh, more snaps can be played that way because when we rattle off all these names at linebacker, you just sit there and you kind of worry like, well, how many of them can actually play? Because you look at Shaka kind of being the leader of the group, there aren't going to be too many instances where you want to take them off the field. But you look at other ways guys can contribute. Uh, you know, special teams is so important, and oftentimes that's really where you see your linebacker sort of be the lead. Uh, let's keep moving along talking about that defense because I know that Dwayne Carter was a name that you mentioned. We know how much of a leader he is for this Duke football team. But uh, tell me something else about the defense that you like. Yeah, I mean, that interior defensive line, um, you know, with with Aeneas Peebles, with Dwayne Carter, with Jamie on Franklin – and among others, obviously, Jamie on Franklin with a prior connection to Coach Elko um, there at, at Notre Dame. I, I don't believe Jamie on actually played that season that he was there, but he was a part of the program. And so he's very, very familiar with the way that Coach Elko operates. And so I actually believe he's going to be an important uh, part. And he, he was he was good for us last year as well um, as a transfer in from Notre Dame. And so and then we have guys like Michael Reese and. Uh, and that, who, who, you know, some of these guys don't get the, the comp. We don't talk about them, you know, as much, but that room, RJ Oban last year, um, you know, we know, uh, got his, the play in time there. Um, uh, Aaron Hall is another one. There's just a lot of guys, Christian Rory. I could go on the list. None of these guys are Chris Rump and that's fine. We've spoken about that before. Uh, none of them are Chris Rump. But we do know this. We do know that there are solid, um, legitimate football players on this D-line. And so I think there's some positives there. Like I said, the interior, the team, the football team is led by interior defensive linemen and Dwayne Carter. So that has to be a positive, right? And so at the end of the day, uh, I I don't mind where we're at on the D-line at all. Really excited to see that defense come together because, again, they're, they're led by head coach Mike Elko, who's been such a great visionary and gets things done. Uh, not too many people were able to knock off Bryce Young in that Alabama offense last season. And, and Young, of course, the Heisman favorite going into the year. And at Texas A&M, Mike Elko had an amazing game plan against the gunslinger and Bryce Young. And we'll see what he's able to do uh, over in the ACC this year, leading uh, our Duke Blue Devils on the defensive end. All right, I want to wrap up today's show. We're going to talk a little basketball as Josh Cox joins us on the show. We do an NBA check-in every now and again. That's in just a moment. Today's episode of Lockdown Blue Devils is brought to you by our partners at Bet Online, continuing to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including this year's basketball playoffs, Major League Baseball scores, fights, and even next season's NFL futures. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sporting, wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online where the game starts. Final segment here today of Lockdown Blue Devils. JJ Jackson hanging out with my buddy Josh Cox from Duke Football Talks Section 17 podcast. If you're watching us on YouTube, this is awesome because you're able to see uh, merch that Josh Cox is sporting there with Duke Football Talk. Tell us a little bit. I know we got a new logo, Josh, and, and tell folks if they're just listening to us for the first time, who is this Josh Cox guy? Tell them a little bit about the podcast. Yeah, so um, two years ago, uh, we decided to, to start a podcast. We had been sitting together for five years, um, and we had started a Twitter handle and just interacted through Twitter and uh, in a Facebook group. And we're like, you know what? The time. There was not a Duke football podcast at all other than the official Duke football podcast. And so we're like, you know what, they're not Duke football enough. And so we started. Now, ironically, uh, we started and we immediately went two and nine, three and nine, uh, you know, in in two seasons. Um, And so not the greatest time uh, as far as success. 
Uh, but what we saw is that people that are Duke football fans really enjoy hearing people talk about Duke football. And from now, now, now there are a couple of other Duke football podcasts that have, uh, that have started and we're all for them um, and happy for them as well. So it just feels like that this, this space, there's a little bit more of a Duke football footprint um, in this space. And so we talk Duke football. We do it during the season every week. We try to go in detail. Uh, we try to interview um, some players every now and then. We like to talk about our opponents um, and, and see what's going on there. This past year, we spoke to play-by-play uh, guys from our opponents leading up the games. We plan on doing the same thing this year as long as we get compliance from those uh, those guys. So, yeah, if you, are, if you are Duke football, now here's the thing. We are Duke football specific. We don't talk about that round ball on our podcast. I talk about it here with J.J., we don't talk about the round ball on our podcast. We don't even know, does Duke even play basketball, uh, according yeah. to us? It is just Duke football. And so Section 17 Podcast, we'd appreciate it. You guys have been so kind to us and leaving us reviews, five-star reviews and ratings and whatnot. But we'd appreciate it, obviously, as J.J. would here on Locked On. And by the way, we appreciate J.J. and what you, you do here on the Locked On Network, man. I know that it, it is not easy, especially in offseason, as you're moving into the offseason, uh, five days a week and, and things like that to put out the content you do and you do a great job, man. So we, we appreciate you letting us come on um, and talk a little bit, not only football, but every now and then dabbling into basketball. I love your basketball takes, Josh. And and I agree. I, I couldn't have said it better. I do appreciate the kind words and I appreciate the friendship that we've been to, able to develop over the last years. The Section 17 podcast has been able to celebrate five football wins. Let's look at it that way over the last two seasons. Uh, but uh, let, let's talk basketball. So today we've got one series getting started, and, and we're back to the point in the year where uh, it's Eastern and Western Conference finals time. People want to know about what the former Duke players in the NBA are doing, and Jason Tatum is absolutely the star of the world right now, leading the Boston Celtics on to the Eastern Conference finals. But with that, as we leave another round of the playoffs, we started with 16 guys in the NBA playoffs. We're now only down to one with Tatum left trying to go for a ring as uh, Tyus Jones and Grayson Allen were recently defeated in the uh, semifinals. So let's kind of start there as uh, all of a sudden two more guys exit. They're entering offseason mode, and it's only Tatum left. Yeah, I mean, the last time we were on here, we spoke of uh, just how well Grayson Allen had played in that previous uh, series, and he had. Uh, but this series just wasn't it wasn't his it wasn't for him. Uh, he couldn't stay on the court much. Uh, Grayson has improved on the defensive end, but he's he's not yet, uh, what I would call a good NBA defender, and uh, he's going to have to commit himself to that in order to stay on the court because I do believe he brings great value to a team <clears throat> when he can shoot the ball. And so he's got to stay on the court. He's got to, he's got to get um, <clears throat> better on the defensive end. Uh, on the flip side, excuse me. <clears throat> no, and with Grace and Allen, I'll just add the fact that the shots just weren't falling. They, <clears throat> they weren't. We're brought to you by Cook Zero. We're yeah, not really. But anyway, <laughs> um, no, the shots weren't falling. And here's the thing. When your shots aren't falling and you can't, you can't lock down someone on the defensive end, <clears throat> then you get Duncan Robinson. So the same thing is happening to Duncan Robinson. They couldn't play him because he's not getting stops. And whereas a guy like Max Struess, he can do both. He can play defense, and he also hits shots. Well, it's the same thing. I mean, Wesley Matthews uh, got in that rotation big time, and then Pat Connison. The, those guys are taking his minutes. And at the end of the day, I understand it. I love Grayson. I'm not a hater uh, you know, on Grayson. I just feel like if he's going to be an integral part of a team that makes it to the – to the Eastern Conference Finals, he's going to have to become a better defender. Um, now, on the flip side, Tyus had an incredible uh, series. And, you know, obviously Ja got injured. Tyus comes out. He is already playing fine as, as a backup, but he came out and really exerted himself um, as a starter. Uh, I don't know how much more it's going to take before teams start saying, hey, Tyus Jones could be our starting point guard for our team. I, I don't know what more he needs to do to tell a team that maybe, Hey, we need to make a deal. We need to make a trade. We need to go after that guy because he's proving every year that he can run the point at an elite level. And only going to get better with experience. I mean, it's, it's just kind of crazy to see the player that Tyus has developed in Tyus and Grayson eliminated. They both come in the same recruiting class, both stars of 
the 2015 national title team for Duke. So obviously we're going to have super fond memories of them. Tyus Jones recently on a social media platform thanked Grizzlies fans for another year in the books and uh, started it off by saying year seven. And I just couldn't believe it. Like Tyus Jones just finished his seventh year in the NBA. And you're right, Josh, it is about time that uh, he, he doesn't have to star in this backup role anymore, that he can go out and find his own squad. Yeah, for sure. I, and I think a team will do that. I, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I'm not here to play NBA GM, but if I had an aging point guard, cough, cough, Phoenix, um, I think a guy like Tyus Jones makes perfect sense other than a shot in the dark campaign, just in my opinion. And, and Phoenix is just fresh on my brain because they were just in the playoffs. Uh, but, you know, there are probably other teams that have some aging point guards. Um, I mean, if you're, if you're wanting my – what I would love to see – is I would love to see him on Boston, even if it means that he's got to uh, play behind Marcus Smart for another couple of years. At the end of the day, I think eventually he could take the reins there. But I, once again, those are all speculation. I don't know money answers of the NBA enough to know what even makes sense. I've not looked at his contract. I've got no idea. But at the end of the day, I would love to see Tyus get a shot. And, and who knows? Memphis may at some point in time uh, come to the, the, the sense of like, hey, we feel like our team runs the best when Ja can play off the ball a little bit more uh, and really, really hunt his shot. And maybe maybe they start, and they've done this a little bit, but playing a little bit of Ja Morant in the game with Tyus Jones. So at the end of the day, I love him. I'm a Jones, I'm a Jones family uh, fan. Love what Trey's doing uh, as well. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for our guys. No doubt. So here we are. We're on this Tuesday edition of the Lockdown Blue Devils podcast. A little bit later tonight, we will see the Eastern Conference Finals get started between two teams, the Miami Heat and the Boston Celtics. Tatum, of course, starring for the Celtics. It's two franchises that have played against one another so many times a decade ago, over and over again. The difference is LeBron James and Dwayne Wade aren't playing for those Miami Heat. Paul Pierce, KG, Ray Allen, the big three of the Celtics, a little bit different. It's now Tatum starring in his role, leading the way for Boston and, uh, Man, that guy has really improved as a basketball player, and the entire world has seen it this postseason. I mean, he's a first-team All-NBA player um, at the end of the day, and, and I don't think there's really any denying it. I mean, I, and I think he – not only did he prove it in the previous series against Brooklyn where he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Kevin Durant, and, I mean, as blasphemous as it sounds, he won the battle. Like, I, you know, I, you can say whatever you want to. Kevin Durant is still – the most skilled player on the planet yeah. probably. But at the end of the day, as far as that was serious, he won the battle. You're right. Jason Tatum won. He won that. And then he comes in and I understand he was not, you know, Giannis is a completely different beast. He's like Shaq with dribbling skills. Um, and so that was a little bit different. It wasn't like they were matched up one-on-one, -on -one. but you could say this. I mean, that game six where Tatum drops, what, 46 points. I think Giannis had 44 points. Um, and Boston gets the win. I mean, to me, that's a defining moment in your career. You're going to look back in Jason Tatum's career, and you're going to say, first of all, you're going to say this season as a whole was the season that he he took that next step, right? Um, you're going to you're going to definitely look at this season, and I, I think within this season there are some moments, and none bigger than Game Six against Milwaukee, uh, dropping that. And then, I man, maybe this is I think this is growth. Because I don't know that he was good at this previously. In game seven, he was efficient. He did not shot hunt. He was very, very content with making the right basketball play right. and not forcing it. And I mean, you know, a couple of the passes that he made when they were going on that run at the end of the third quarter, beginning of the fourth quarter, where they kind of put the game away. And he came back in in that fourth quarter. I was like, man, he's going to come in and he's going to try to, you know, I don't know. Maybe I'm just reverting back to like the one years at Duke, and I know this was it was okay then, but I'm like, man, he's going to try to drop, get to 40 points or whatever. No, he comes in and hits Peyton Pritchard, open three. He comes in, he hits Grant Williams, open three. I just love his game, man. He's complete on offense, and now he's committed himself to being a good defender. And um, I, Carolina fans, as if any of them would be listening to this, <laughs> I saw one today on Twitter talking about, oh, all this talk about. Carolina doesn't have NBA players. You know, we have two players left in the playoffs, and their two players are Reggie Bullock, who, mad respect to Reggie Bullock, has improved his game, 
playing well for, for Dallas. And then they were like Theo Pinson. I'm like, please. Like you could take you could take Reggie Bullock and Theo Pinson and multiply them by like five before you ever even begin to approach the impact that Jason Tatum has in the NBA right now. So like look, our guy our guy Tatum is incredible. Um I'm I'm all in on Boston and um it's gonna be interesting so 2020 in the bubble. You remember uh, Miami and Boston played in the Eastern Conference Finals. Miami got the upper hand. This is a little bit of a different Boston team. Uh, no Kemba Walker. Um, Horford back. I believe that was the year Horford was gone. Um, I think Boston's the most complete team remaining. We'll see what happens. Yeah, and for this Miami team, you could see a, a bit of a different team for the Heat. Uh, as if, you you know, a lot of people are in this world where – they don't pay attention much at all to, to the NBA when college basketball is going on. And then when the playoffs get around, they're diving back in because they love the sport so much. And you and I are watching both at all times throughout the season. You start to watch these conference finals, and it's like, oh, my gosh, how did Kyle Lowry end up on the Miami Heat? Why is he not with Toronto anymore? However, Lowry's hurt. And so it, it, that's a different dynamic. And uh, as of right now, he's not playing. Uh, in the first game, and we'll see whether or not he's able to come back and, and be able to be a part of the Heat. So uh, a little bit more, you think the Celtics have what it takes to knock off Miami, or is Miami just so complete of a team that uh, you could see them winning this? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be a hater on the Heat because I love the Heat. They are deep. As you mentioned watching the NBA all season. If you watch the Heat the entire season – like they're like different teams. Like Bam was out for a while, injured, so they look completely different. <clears throat> uh, they look a little bit different, you know, without without Lowry. Um, Duncan Robinson was starting, and now for several games in the playoffs, he didn't even get on the court. You know, you got the addition of, of Victor Oladipo come back, and they are. And then of course, Jimmy. We can't talk about it without mentioning Jimmy Butler. I mean, Jimmy can. Jimmy's an incredible player. Um, but, but I, I will say this, they played a terrible Hawks team. They were bad. They were not good. No, they were nothing like the Hawks team of last year and they beat them. They played Philly with no Joel Embiid for the first two games. And then a shell of Joel Embiid for the rest of the series, a uh, James Harden who had one good game, who every other game in that series looked like a YMCA player doesn't play defense anyway. So they had the path that Miami has had to get to the finals pretty easy in comparison to the Brooklyn Nets who everybody, even though they were the seven seed, everyone was like, they they're going to come out of the East, right? That's what everyone's saying. Boston goes in, takes care of business, then plays the best player on the planet in Giannis. Um, and I understand that they didn't have Chris Middleton, but also Boston didn't have Robert Williams. And I don't think enough people were talking about that. They win that series. Boston is battle-tested. Boston has been to game seven against Giannis. In my opinion, they hold that edge, I feel like, over Miami. Now, if Miami comes out and, and wins in six, I'm not going to be shocked. Uh, I just feel like Miami is that team, man. I'm trying to, I'm trying to compare them. It's like when the Arizona Cardinals in football were leading the NFC, and you're like, "Wow, Arizona's eight and one or seven and one." Right? They're they're not necessarily, and I kind of feel that way about Miami. Like I I love Jimmy Butler, but Jimmy Butler is the only player on that team that I think you can say that dude is definitely elite. That's it. Now Bam yeah. is right there on the cusp, but to me, with Boston, you've got Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum that are certified stars. I just think at the end of the day. Those two guys are going to carry Boston. And so nothing against Miami. Love Miami. It's going to be a great series, but I think Boston wins it. That's my favorite part in all of this is just how good of a series it's going to be. Spolstra is an absolute legend. I mean, that guy gets it done no matter who's on his team as a coach. And, and Pat Riley has done such a good job as an executive. Tyler Hero wins six man of the year this year uh, for the Miami Heat. But boy, Boston has been uh, so much fun to watch. If you've got – Grant Williams stock right now. I mean, that guy's just playing really well for Boston. A Charlotte, North Carolina kid. Uh, and I know we got a lot of North Carolina listeners in the house. And then, of course, he starred for the Tennessee Volunteers for a number of years. And uh, our boy Tatum, of course, 
ready to take over. I think Boston gets it done as well, and I think they go to the NBA Finals. Josh, this was great as always. Really do appreciate you, you taking time to uh, join me on the show today. JJ, I appreciate it, man. I had a great time. That's Josh Cox from Duke Football Talks Section 17 Podcast joining us here on the show today, talking all things Duke football and about those NBA playoffs as they're off and rolling. Follow me on Twitter at underscore JJ underscore Jackson underscore. Follow the show on Twitter at LO underscore Blue Devils. That's going to do it for today's show. On tomorrow's show, I'll talk with Donald Wine from Duke Basketball Report. It's going to be a fun conversation to check up with him. That'll do it. Thanks so much for listening. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you and good day.